The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program, depending on their content. Contract ex uh, expectations. And the presentation will be given by uh, Mr. Nick uh, you know, Beristain, uh, who's currently working as um, uh, the lab manager at Prairie Materials um, in Chicago, right? Yes. Yeah. So, Nick, over to you. Thank you. I in no way knew that uh, before I got up here, I was going to be thrown to like three or four times with other Prairie slides. So, <laughs> I appreciate from that from both of you guys. Um, so my presentation today is going to cover just a bit of what we as Prairie Materials have seen. Um, I guess, like I said, based on the past two presentations, we are kind of the expert in the Chicago market in producing modulus of elasticity concrete, which is good to know. Um, but also just meeting different expectations and constructability requirements. How we try to address those through mixed uh, design considerations. And then finally, just challenges we've seen in both past and ongoing projects with modulus of elasticity requirements. So just a brief history here, um, and I will make it very brief. Prairie has pretty minimal experience up before 2002 with actually using and testing for modulus of elasticity. Um, based on talks with some of the older folks at our company, they did have some testing done internally on 311 South Wacker, but for the most part in that period of time, they were using calculations. Uh, Trump Tower, uh, like Rob had alluded to, has a bit of a complicated history with modulus of elasticity. It was there, but it wasn't really there. Um, thankfully, this was actually a bit of a boon for Prairie in that so much research was done for the testing or for the design in Trump Tower that we had a fairly extensive back catalog that we could pull from moving forward. And Predictably, once we had all that research done and it was sitting there, the projects kind of dried up in terms of modulus of elasticity. So it went on the shelf for quite a bit. Um, in terms of completed projects, in 2015, we started a project 151 North Riverside. That one's Trump right there. Um, and you can see, thanks to that beautiful bottom of the structure, required quite a bit of modulus of elasticity concrete. So that was really us getting our feet wet again in this sort of specification where modulus of elasticity was actively being tested throughout the span of the project. Drawing from our past experiences, as of 2015, we were very confident that we could consistently deliver modulus of elasticity concrete with values up to 6.6 .6 million. Both 115 North Riverside, but also through Trump, we knew that generally our current um, high strength and ultra high strength concrete would be comfortable in meeting that sort of requirement. Furthermore, the mixes that we were using and had experience with um, we're able to be produced without substantial, de substantial deviation to the local raw materials. As Bob alluded to, as a concrete producer, that idea of materials being local and mixed design being local is paramount. When we aren't using local materials, our margins become extremely thin. So the efforts that we put into just maximizing what we can get from our local materials is a huge part of testing internally. Um, and also through internal discussions, what our biggest concern was with these projects were constructability requirements. We knew that the Chicago high mise market was still pretty robust even before all the modulus of elasticity requirements had come in, but our customers had come to expect certain performance and constructability things that we weren't sure we, weren't going, we were going to be able to align with the specifications required by designers. So, some projects that we currently have ongoing and just what to look for. This is the Wanda Vista Tower located in Chicago. It starts um, and the main forms at the lower third of the building are all 7 million modulus PSI concrete. This mixed design in particular, the 7 million, 
which you'll also see in another upcoming project, was the only one that really forced us to stretch as a company. We had to look at different materials that we weren't using locally, as well as um, changing a bit of our operations in terms of loading and production. But going up through the building, which you can see a quick snapshot here, this one's a fairly recent picture. Um, in the middle third of the building, we dropped down to a six million mix, and then finally up to a uh, 5.4 million mix. And again, these were mixes that, although they might have been existing under a different name, weren't anything outside of our normal mix catalog of high strength. The next project, which again is currently ongoing, is uh, Grant Park Tower. This has a bit of a similar pattern because it was actually designed by the same designer, MKA. And uh, you can see that it again tapers as it moves up. The mix design for the 7 million was a bit different than the old mix design, and that was simply because we had had um, some experience under our belt with that mix design, so we knew how to tweak as we were going along. The 6.6 .6 and the 6.25, though, were essentially identical or slightly different, mostly in water cement ratio, um, from the mixes for the Wanda Vista project tower. And finally, we have another project ongoing, which is the Wolf Point East project. Uh, we were excited about this project because it was actually with a different GC. We've been pretty extensively using one GC for most of our both high strength, high rise, and MOE projects. So it was an example, or it was an opportunity for us to go out and see a bit of a different placement, um, pumping, all those sorts of operations. So this job, it's very, very new. Um, they still haven't actually gotten out of the ground. Caissons are poured. They've done some substructure, but the bulk of the work is still yet to be poured. This, too, follows very similar mixed designs in terms of the 7 million, 6.4, and 5.8 million. So with all that taken into account, uh, just a bit of a snapshot on what we've done so far. Since 2016, when we really started to get back into modulus of elasticity, we've been able to produce successfully 35,000 yards of the 7 million mix, along with 6,000 yards of the 6.6 .6 million and 10,000 yards of the 6 million. In the 7 million mix, based on results we've seen from um, both our next speaker or our second to next speaker and our own internal results, I don't believe we've seen failing results thus far on that. Um, so it has been a very successful project. We've built quite a bit of safety into that mix, and our projections so far have looked very good. In terms of just basic lab testing, we've done over 25,000 compression tests with these mixes. On a, any given day um, in our lab, we tend to run about 10 to 15 sets of the modulus of elasticity mixes for compression tests, but we tend to only run one to four for the actual ASTM C469 modulus of elasticity. And you can see from this picture, this is the actual rig setup. Um, I'm sure you'll see a picture later, but this one is just for static modulus of elasticity and does not include the center ring for determining Poisson's ratio. And now we kind of get to the real challenge for a producer in delivering these sorts of mixes. Um, as with any mix in a high profile project, we are going to do extensive trial batches, and we did for this type of mixes, both in the past with the work on Trump, but also as the MOE specification came back around with the new projects. And through those trial batches as a producer, you're going to know, are you going to meet your MOE? Are you going to meet your strength? your thermal considerations, what sort of uh, thermal plans we're going to have to put together, chloride ions, those sorts of things. As a producer, really the trap that we fall into is not knowing our individual customers and, and even their individual site setups of constructability requirements. This concrete, for the most part, exists in between a true SCC and a flowable concrete. So we've had to work extensively with both designers, but also with our customers to determine when it's appropriate to use a slump range, what slump range to use, and also when it's appropriate to use a spread range. Um, and this does lead to quite a bit of confusion on the job site. You now have to have all these people who are informed to look for a slump or to look for a spread, but also depending on the placement, um, we might have two nearly identical mixes, one designed to be used for puddling while another is used for major vertical forms that are going to have very different consistency measures. Pumpability has shown to be, in our experience recently, the most focused on by our customers. Um, 
because of the use of high-end pumps that we now see in the Chicago market, and I'll get back to that in a bit. Early strengths are always a concern. Uh, like I said, a lot of our customers have become con uh, accustomed to certain performance and construction measures in terms of when they can strip and when they can post tension. So if we fail to meet those in order to meet our modulus of elasticity or strength, we're going to hear about it, and it's a big concern. And then finally, workability retention. Um, these mixes have extreme amounts of chemical admixtures, very low water cement ratios, and they generally tend to border on concrete that looks very unfriendly to the average finisher or pump operator. So maintaining workability throughout anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour as it's pumped up to the 30th floor, the 50th floor, and so on is a key concern for us. And like I said, those unknown constructability requirements really can be a killer. Um, our general contractors often will tell us what they want from the mix that is completely separate from the designer specification. Things like delivered yards per hour, pumped yards per hour, and whether or not they want one, two, even three quality technicians on site from the producer are all things that are occasionally put into the project POs that we sign with our customers. And as a technician, as a quality person, it's very rare that our sales group comes to us and says, you need to be accountable for all these things. We don't know these things until it's too late. We've already designed the mix, and we didn't have to think about pumped yards per hour or what the actual pump pressure was. So as a producer, it's important to be vigilant to the change in requirements, requests of customers. And by vigilant, I mean you have to be able to both protect yourself, but at the same time, keep your customer happy and be willing to work with them. We all know that pump pressures, workability, and wear on placing equipment are going to vary drastically through the life cycle of a pour. As the pump pressure goes, or as the building starts to get higher and higher, as we move pumps, as the staging increases, there's going to be more favorable and less favorable, favorable setups for us. So we need to be able to manage that. And arguably, the easiest way to manage that is through mixed design. And so we try to take all this into accountability. Um, in terms of many of the properties that Van alluded to in his presentation. So thankfully, I don't have to go through all that. But um, again, these are where we really start to decide based on production factors, on cost factors, if we can do things with our local or if we need to bring in non-local aggregates, if we need to adjust our cementitious. And that could also include um, associated costs to putting up silos for cementitious material, to new lines running in plants, and what types of plants can do this. Um, thus far, we've only placed and produced this concrete with wet batch or central mix plants. We've never even tried to run this through a dry batch plant, um, mostly because I don't want my production guy to kill me. But um, <laughs> these are all things that have to be considered. And as the producer, we are really responsible for that practical and pragmatic side in a lot of ways to producing these things. Um, along those lines, even having a very robust, robust and diverse mix catalog, you're not likely to meet all of the contractor's requirements. Um, like I said before, the various consistencies that might exist for one single mix design or one single design aspect are usually going to encompass two, maybe even three mixed designs. Um, I know there was a question before about aggregate. And we might have a 7 million modulus mix with a more coarse aggregate up to a 3 quarter inch size or a 1 inch nominal aggregate for an area that we know we have very low congestion. But we also have to have one at a half inch nominal or even a 3, quarter, three eighths inch nominal when we know that we have extensive rebar congestion. So. Um, the amount of front loading in terms of testing, in terms of actually designing mixes and having data to submit to designers is quite a challenge for a ready mix producer. Also, um, and this is just a running theme because I get all the phone calls about this, the changes in pumping requirements in the last two years has suddenly become the hot topic for most of our customers. They're calling me saying, here's where my pump pressure is, here's where my bar is, here's what my finishers are telling me. And I'm getting all that different information from the guy at the base working the pump, from the guy up top who's actually finishing the concrete. And it's really about working with our customer and our, the placement crew to make sure that all parties are, are 
are discussed and their needs are discussed because it's unlikely that we'll be able to meet everyone's needs on any given day, but trying to grab as many stakeholders and supporting them is arguably what we have to do in order to keep performing on these jobs and to keep our customers happy. So with that being said, the producer must ensure that they can reasonably adjust their mixes with the GC and the designer, in essence, just to keep making people happy and meeting all those requirements. Obviously, we are going to strive to meet the design requirements 100% of the time, but the constructability aspects are something that we always don't have a say in and we're not always aware of. So in order to meet that, we need to have some flexibility. And even today, with some of these specifications, we see restrictions in terms of what the pace can contain, what the percentages we can see on certain types of aggregates, the percentages we can see on different cementitious materials, fly ash being a particular concern to a lot of designers. So um, the producer definitely needs some flexibility within reason, of course. We don't want to just switch it every day and try and make something new. It makes it even harder on us. Um, so with that said, just some, a quick review of the challenges. Um, the advanced nature of these products have forced us, VC Prairie Material, as a producer and our partner GCs to challenge our standard operating procedures. The 7 million mix in particular has been uh, something that we had to actively design, test R&D through the entire process and continue to test extensively to make sure that for the next jobs or the next couple jobs, if we need to go to a 7.25, which we feel is totally attainable, we have both the data and the experience in order to do that. Um, knowing and working with our GCs that our goals may not always align and we are going to have to come to some relative compromise on that. And then finally, just maintaining open communication with each of the shareholders. As a producer, we want to keep everyone happy because um, that keeps us happy, but that might not always happen. Another good ally that we found in this is independent testing labs. Working with these groups can provide invaluable resource for a concrete producer. If we know exactly how often um, we should be testing, how often um, they're going to be testing, what they're looking for, how materials, as you can see from the middle picture, curing, how it's going to be handled, that really helps us align our internal results with what we're getting from the verified third-party testing lab. And that can help a lot. This is still a, um, an aspect of concrete that's very much residing in a gray area. We try and draw conclusions from our internal data, from the external data we're receiving from the labs, and it's still pretty hazy for the most part, even though we have a substantial amount of data at this point. So working to standardize these things, particularly for a given project with a testing lab, can really help bring some of that noise out and focus on what's important. And then finally, just communication between concrete inspectors can address both the plastic and hardened concrete issues. Again, we're just trying to keep everyone within spec and also making sure that we aren't putting any undue work on any of the stakeholders. So in conclusion, high modulus of elasticity concrete, especially in the Chicago market, can be consistently and confidently produced by most concrete producers with high strength experience. Um, with the exception of the higher modulus of elasticity, 7, 7.25, these are things that can reasonably be achieved most likely with current high strength concrete mix designs. Um, that being said, producers must take the lead and take deliberate steps to protect themselves by establishing clear guidelines and open lines of communication with the relevant stakeholders. And finally, communication again, just being maintained both on a day to day level during pre design and during actual placement. Thank you.